this session is your chance to reflect on all those little things that you've picked up over two days. Right? The friend you've made, the insight you've grabbed, that partner you didn't know was out there, right? the learning that you've experienced you want to bring back to your organization, uh, the thing that you've confronted that makes you think we shouldn't have been doing that, like all these different things you've been gathering. Right? That's inevitably that happens if this conference is like most that we go to, all the good stuff happened in the hallways, right? Or sometime late last night, and, um, and so you have been in gathering mode. It's a lot like what we do in our communities, right? We are out making connection, trying to figure out who's there and who is uh, interested in a common goal. And the challenge, of course, is how do you bring a lot of those things into some kind of alignment? So instead of it being a disparate set of activities, or for you over the two days, a disparate set of learnings, but you want to try to bring them, and in our communities we try to bring them into alignment, so why? We can have a bigger impact. And the simplicity of that statement, maybe for you going home, uh, driving home, catching a lift, you know, uh, cycling, going for the walk, whatever it is, getting on an airplane, I think you're going to be successful at aligning things for yourself. Is you have that span of control, right? You can figure out what to let go of and what to bring back into your organization. But in our work in community, right, that opportunity of bringing people together to bring organizations together, mandates together, creating a means by which collective work can happen is much more difficult. And so for the next hour and a bit, uh, we've got a bit of wisdom and encouragement from folks here who know some of the do's and don'ts of trying to draw that alignment together in their communities or across communities. <laughs> around the important work uh, related to financial empowerment. Uh, so we're going to hear from each of them for about five minutes about what they've learned in doing that, what's worked, what, what hasn't, right? And you'll be thinking of your questions. Like Amanda, you'll just come up to the microphones when we're done. Uh, but we'll hear from each of them for about five minutes, and then we'll encourage a conversation. OK? A thumbs up if that sounds good. OK, not bad, right? <laughs> Should I ask the alternative? You know that, that no. Instead of that, let me introduce uh, Graham Klein, uh, uh, executive director with uh, the Peel Children and Youth Initiative. A deep experience, tons in R and D, and evaluation, and I gather um, a bit of provocative uh, reflection for us. Following Graham will be Althea Arsenault, the manager of resource development out out New Brunswick Way uh, Economic and Social Inclusion Corporation. Uh, has been with that organization since day one and has a deep interest in triathlon. So those of you that are into cycling, swimming, running, you can talk to Althea. Jonathan Mintz uh, follows on, President and CEO of Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund and I think this is the part we're keen on for this, the coalition spanning many cities across the U.S. and question mark, how about Canada? Right, and, uh, and then, of course, Mei Wong, needs no introduction, Executive Director, Omega Foundation, Smart Saver, all that's going on about the outreach around the Canada Learning Bond, okay? So they are your provocateurs around how we align for impact. Graham, you are up. Thank you, Ian. All right, we get five minutes, so we're going to rip right into this. Uh, I work for the Peel Children and Youth Initiative. Peel is the region just west of Toronto, Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon. It's a p population of just over a million people. Uh, so, and, uh, and probably Canada's most ethnically diverse community, uh, it, it, I would say, right across the country. So, organization like PCYI was brand new when I got there, but it's an odd outfit uh, because we're not really uh, there to provide services. And so before this organization was built, and they said, well, what kind of an enabling organization would you like? They, caught, they spoke with the people in the community, and they said, you know, what are our priorities? And one of them was to help our kids participate in post-secondary education. With that in mind, we were very early in the going and stumbled upon the work of the Omega Foundation and Smart Saver, and we, we owe them an enormous debt for the resources that they were able to provide. But for us, uh, the organization was never going to provide direct service. Our strategy was going to be different. 
The Peel Children and Youth Initiative uh, is interesting because it's an organization that produces good quality research. We disseminate and engage people across various sectors, but then we also pull people together and facilitate discussions and say, so this is what the evidence says, what are we going to do about it as a community? It is right out of the collective impact literature in terms of a backbone organization, but then we also evaluate and measure what we do. We have a board that's comprised of all the major players who have an important role to play in the lives of children and youth, uh, medical officer health, directors of education, chief of police, all the usual suspects. And in many communities, you will have seen a gathering of these people on somebody's letterhead, okay? It's designed to kind of scare you because look at who they got on their board for crying out loud. But in our instance, from the beginning, the principle was if we agreed to do something, you were gonna go back to your organization and make it happen. So when we agreed to take on the Canada Learning Bond as a priority, we had at least 22 partners immediately in big systems who were going to go back and enable this to happen. Our focus has always been on changing policies, practices, and systems. That's the mantra we repeat. And so when we came to this work, the Canada Learning Bond, it was in two phases. Spread the word and engage people. And then secondly, create something that was sustainable through systems change. It was never about delivering a program, but really rather grafting the capacity to, to speak to families about the Canada Learning Bond onto our existing services and systems from the outset. And so it was a time limit effort, uh, and we had no new money to do it, no carrots and no sticks, as I've often said. It was all done by goodwill, facilitation, and research. So what did we learn that was hard learned? I think the, the interesting part about this, and you can go to the literature about uh, you know, health outcomes. Education is still going to be number one. It's going to get stronger and stronger. And while the alignment is clear to a lot of potential organizations, it's not really in anybody's mandate. In Peel, we don't have an outfit like Momentum, uh, or, or in some of your communities, you will have somebody that's interested in the economic development portfolio of low-income families. We had nothing of that sort. And so while it was, it was important to try to get out to as many organizations as we could, we were trying to align with different cultures. And so what makes the police interested is very different than what works in community centers, the time it takes to engage a children's aid society. And so what you see is all of these different cultures that you have to find a way to permeate with a good idea that aligns with their mission, but no new money to help them do it, okay? And I'm sure you realize everybody is really, really, really super busy, okay? So it's, a, it's an important challenge to understand the different cultural systems that are in play when you're trying to engage across sectors. What did we learn? The good stuff. All right, data is extremely powerful. We had to fight to get the data when we were starting with our colleagues from HRSDC. I sent a very, very nasty email one day about how we were gonna need this data and uh, the fellow called me the very next day and he said, I've drafted some of these emails, I just never sent them to anybody. <laughs> But he called me the next day, and so we went to visit, and so all of a sudden we agreed that it was important if I was going to engage all of these organizations that I had to be able to tell them if it worked or not. And so he capitulated, and we ended up getting very good quarterly data. Extremely powerful for engaging political systems, being able to report those numbers, the percentage growth, the dollars that would be eligible to low-income families incredibly important in terms of building support. So it not only allowed us to, to report out, but it allowed us to direct our efforts by forward postal sorting code. So we knew where there was high degrees of eligible families, and we could speak to the agencies and organizations that were in those communities. We could target our efforts, in fact, with the data that we had. Number two, broad outreach. So we went after all and sundry. Pretty much anybody that worked with families at all that would have that trusting relationship with them. And for a while, the back office looked like uh, the, the Kirby vacuum cleaner war room. And we were going after every, we had our lists and we were getting after everybody. And, and in retrospect, while it was powerful and you got traction in a lot of places you might not have expected, we might have done better to pick a few spots where there's key points of intersection and there's a great deal of trust between the organization and the families with whom they work. And I think that varies from community to community, but in our area, the logistical challenge of trying to engage everybody and their dog was incredible and something I would rethink if I was doing it again. The interesting part about this, we did a lot of research on parents, looked at 26 different services that are available for early child development. And we discovered the incredibly important role that social support plays. And it varies across services. So the more sophisticated the service, like breastfeeding and some of the parenting classes, you need a great deal of social support before you're even going to those things. 
But where do parents who are completely disconnected go? Parks, playgrounds, community centers, and libraries. Those are the places people congregate who don't have a network of social support. And while those organizations might not be well suited to delivering the services, that's where we can find parents who are isolated and will not hear about this work through uh, word of mouth. Last struggle was with bank engagement, um, and I'm delighted to see the representation here from the banks and, and the organizations in the financial services sector. We found that despite the, uh, the, the one-page sheet that we had from each of the five major banks, that when you walked, uh, when a low-income family walked into a bank, they said, well, you're here for what? You, you uh, what? Free Canada Alert? What are you talking about, right? And so eventually what we had to do was pick off local branch banks, more labor-intensive, but it worked. We'd go to the branch manager with the data, who's in their neighborhood, what they look like, how many of them there are, and motivated that individual bank, bank branch manager to take an interest in the work. So a, a, a struggle, but we, we persevered through that and got some real traction because we had the data. If I think about a missed opportunity that pertains to the private sector, we don't have a lot of head offices in our area. But I still think that the payroll deduction plan, moving this into uh, Canada Learning Bond into payroll deductions for organizations like Walmart, Canadian Tire, all of those places who are already donating their charitable dollars to support participation from families who can't afford things is a natural alignment. We didn't have the sophistication or the capacity to do it, but I still think that's an important opportunity. Where do we end up? Our results were, were pretty good. Uh, went up from 29% to about 42% of the population there. And fortunately, in Peel, the kids just keep on coming who are eligible. <laughs> so it was like running up a sandy hill. We ended up at 41%. It would have been 56% if we had managed to close the borders when we started. <laughs> Unfortunately, weren't. And, and so we ended up with 22 partners who have adapted this as part of their work routinely with families, so they've changed their policies and practices. It is, in essence, a system you will be touched by somebody. Now, we've turned the work over. And as a gardener, I know that if you don't pay attention to your garden, it will eventually wither and die. And I'm a little haunted by that. And I'm thinking about how I might work with some of my colleagues here to ferment a small revolution in Peel. Last comment I would make, and this is just because I'm, I'm like this. When I, when I hear terms like financial literacy, I, I mean, I roofed for quite a number of years, put myself through school. Financial literacy sounds like two things I'm not very good at to the guys that I used to work with. All right, and I, and I worry about our terminology. Financial well-being, I'm trying to think about where that is on the Maslow curve. Oh, it, it's on page six, it's not on the curve. And I think after you achieve well-being, then you might be thinking about empowerment. So I, I just worry that we're using the language of the helpers and that we may not resonate the way we could if we really took the perspective of those who we seek to empower and help with their financial literacy. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm with the Economic and Social Inclusion Corporation. Its acronym is ESIC, and that's what I'm going to call it. ESIC has been around for about five years, thanks to, if anyone knows this person, Jim Hughes. Yay! <laughs> Jim was brought down to New Brunswick to address the poverty issue in our province. And through his hard work and dedication, um, and through a lot of provincial roundtables and discussions, and moving all around the province, the people of the province of New Brunswick developed the Economic and Social Inclusion plan, plan, Overcoming Poverty Together. The way to protect this plan so that it didn't go poof when the next government came around, we were made into a crown corporation. So we, we can still go poof, but we're a little bit more protected than a secretary who just goes out of whim. What we do is we look at alignment and champions and doing group projects together. So in discussing with a lot of people here, I've got to say, I'm really blessed. We are really blessed in New Brunswick for our little small province is that our board of directors is made up of 22 people. We have four government ministers. We have four representatives of business from the high end to the low end, big business to small business. We have four reps of nonprofit and we have the most important eight citizens, people who are or were living in poverty. We believe that we cannot develop any program for people in poverty without getting their feedback. We don't know what's best for them. We don't live in poverty, but they do. So they are there to shake our heads and say, 
but that doesn't work. But this will. They're the people that when I develop a program or if I have a thought and I come back from these conferences, I got to go I'll phone Juanita and I'll say, Juanita, what do you think of this? Um, Dr. Block's um, documents, I sent those to Juanita and I said, spread them around Crescent Valley and St. John. Tell me what your people think. Would it be something that they would take home from the physician and go file their income tax? That is what is the most important to us. We divide the province into 12 regions. Each region is funded by ESIC. We give them $62,500 a year for their administration. They can come, then come to us for a pot of money up to uh, about $2 million for either action grants or transportation grants. Their structure that they have in those community inclusion networks all have to resemble what we do. Government, business, nonprofit, and citizens. And their citizens have to equal more than all their other members of the board as well. That's how we align people together. Our ministers, when they're at the table, their social development, their education, their post-secondary education, and they're now one is government services. It used to be the Department of uh, Health Inclusive Communities. We can move things at the provincial level because we have those alignments, we have those champions, it makes it easy. But we also have representatives down at the community level. So if we want to move something community-wise, we can do something. If we want to move something regional, we can do it because of our 12 community inclusion networks. Provincially, we can make a difference as well. One story that I always like is that when we were doing the roundtables for OPT1, Overcoming Poverty Together, one, our first plan, we actually had an Irving, the head of Irving, um, we had our minister, and we had Juanita Black. And they were talking about the health card and how when, if a person went off social assistance, they lost their health card because then they had to go work and they were supposed to pay for all their, their benefits. And the, Juanita looked at J.D. Irving and the minister, and she said, I need to keep this card because I need to keep healthy, so I'm going to stay on social assistance. And someone just pointed to the minister and said, fix it. And it was done. We now have a health card that people who leave social assistance can have for three years. So they can stay off of social assistance, but they can still be healthy, not be a drain on the province, be healthy to themselves, grow and establish and be a, a wonderful contributing member to the province of New Brunswick. Hard lessons that we've learned in the first five years. Red tape is always, always going to trip you up. There are always policies that don't talk to another policy, government departments that don't talk to another policy. That's one of the fun things that I like to do. I like to find that red tape and try to get rid of it and bring at least those people in the room so that they can understand your policy does not match this policy and they're working against each other. We all want to be better and have everyone in our province be inclusive and included in communities and feel good about themselves. But red tape talking against each other just wipes everything else that we try to do. A couple things to keep in mind that I always like to do, because I've got a fundraising background. Ask people. You don't know if they want to participate or not, but you have to ask them. A lot of times, when you ask them, they'll say yes. They may be in 100%, they may be in 50%. You may get them right now or in the future. But if you don't ask, you don't have a partner. And those are the partnerships that you need. What we do is we find the champions in our government departments. I have one person in each government department that I can go to and I can say, Mary, I need this from you. Or can you connect me with someone in your department who knows how to do this? And that's how we keep the flow of communication going. We also bring everyone together. Probably on every three to four months, we'll bring all the senior policy analysts, all the different other reps from the different government departments and our partners, we'll sit around the table and say, what are you doing? This is what we're doing. And then you learn something new as well because government websites, like every other group, they don't keep them updated. If you look at the websites, you don't know what they're doing, what new programs they're offering. Are there programs that they're offering that could be good for people in low income? You want people in low income? We can connect you with the people in low income. But it's that open communication, that it's alignment of projects, remembering that you have to tell them what you're doing, and then they have to tell us what, we're, what they are doing as well. So it works that way. One of the, all, the things that I really, really believe in is that you cannot develop any program without talking and communicating and involving the people that you're developing the program for. I think it's just insulting if we don't. We're just standing there being superior and saying, we know what is best for you. We include these people in our programs and our developments so we can say, is this what you want? Do we have it right? Did we name it right? 
I talked earlier um, and yesterday as well about the Community Volunteer Income Tax Program. CVITP, it's government, it's federal. When we sent that information down to our task group down in St. John, said, here's the material. Does it mean anything to you? Would you know that you had to go get your taxes filled? They didn't have a clue. Okay, tell us what you want us to name this program. We want you guys to fill out these taxes. They called it Get Your Piece of the Money Pie. It works. I didn't tell this story, but I'm going to be very quick about this. When we started this program, we had done it in New Brunswick, and we were working with the CRA, so we launched the program. There were a lot of calls going to Newfoundland. Newfoundland phoned Ottawa. Ottawa was, had to respond to, what in the world is New Brunswick doing? What is this get your piece of the money pie? We have no idea what's going on. Why do they want all this? And we're in New Brunswick going, yes, it works. It works. That name caught on because it was the people who were targeted. They named the program. So that's probably my most important thing, I, message that I could say, is align the people. Talk to the people that you're offering the programs with, and then those alignments and those championships and those connections will come naturally. In the spirit of watching a moderator walk out in the middle of a panel earlier, I want to warn you that I might jump off the stage at any moment if I don't look young and thin and with a, <laughs> with a full head of hair. I, just, I can see what you're doing. Don't make me come down there. Um, but enough about what I'm not. Um, uh, so uh, I am really happy to be here. My name is Jonathan Mintz. Uh, I represent your neighbors to the south. And I uh, want to uh, tell you just a tiny bit about my background because it informs um, what I want to talk to you about um, during, during my time here. Um, so I used to be the Consumer Affairs Commissioner for Mayor Bloomberg in the city of New York um, for 12 long years. And um, uh, one of the things that we did as we were struggling to help protect consumers in that marketplace was really start to think about not just how to bring regulatory enforcement powers to bear, um, but how to think about the flip side of the equation, which is why are these people so vulnerable? And when we get up and make some terrific enforcement announcement, what am I offering the people who are in trouble as an alternative? Uh, I think one of the things we know is that when people are in trouble, the predators really start descending. So one of the things we did in our department is we created something called the Office of Financial Empowerment uh, and really tried to put our arms around safe banking, financial counseling, savings, and then consumer protection and call that <laughs> its field and called it financial empowerment and thought about unique ways that government could bring uh, its own value add, that government in control of programs could determine whether or not programs were structured, for example, so that you had to get direct deposit, uh, or it felt like you had to get direct deposit in order to get the benefits that you were looking for, um, whether or not you had to see a counselor, a financial counselor, as step three of a workforce development program, or step four of a domestic violence program, or step two of a prisoner reentry program, and thinking about all the different ways that high quality financial empowerment programs could be useful. That work has really gone well. Uh, there are now cities across the country um, that um, either in the high-powered coalition, the Cities for Financial Empowerment Coalition, or through work that we're funding um, from our organization now, the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund, um, you really see a blossoming, I think, of municipalities, finally step local government, finally stepping up and saying, this issue is so important um, that we can no longer afford to just give um, primary responsibility to the com to the nonprofit community and good luck with their funding but we really we can't ignore it as something that is a, a public mandate uh, and when we had our financial crisis back in 2008 it became clear that underlying financial instability was the the current uh, running through um, so much of our social service issues so um, so when we started developing these programs and they started showing impact when we started talking about the kind of debt uh, that could be reduced from high quality financial counseling f as just one example, um, we realized that we had created this wonderful, what we called sort of a hothouse flower. We had this great little financial empowerment program and it was terrific and it was showing uh, unexpected and wonderful results. Um, but 
who were we kidding? We were really a small player in the larger anti-poverty sphere. Decades and decades and billions of dollars had been going into what I think of as the traditional anti-poverty strategies, um, welfare, food support, housing, um, the, 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 the big players. And here we had this really cool new little thing that people really hadn't been paying a lot of attention to. Financial literacy, as somebody mentioned, um, doesn't garner a whole lot of respect, even if a whole lot of people know that term and say, yes, that's a good idea. Um, and so we started thinking really aggressively about how we could take financial empowerment programs and services and start to use it to solve other larger problems. Um, we call this the super vitamin effect, which is just sort of a quirky way of um, getting uh, a little bit of real estate on, on boards like these in the back. Um, um, but it's really, it's about the host effect. It really is about sort of showing that if you, for example, integrate financial counseling into services being offered in public housing, could you show that not only were these people reducing their debt levels, but they were less likely to fall into arrears on their payments or more quickly going to get out of arrears if they were already in it. Those kinds of host effects, uh, workforce development, were people more likely to get a job, were they more likely to keep their job when they got it. The reason I say all this is because this idea of taking these really exciting programs that we had been developing and, and seeing our partner cities developing as well and integrating them into larger, far more established um, social service programs required Oh, I thought that was my mom. Um, uh, um, required um, very complex partnerships. Um, and it, it required um, uh, partnerships even with sister and brother commissioners in the same administration. Very, very difficult. So we learned a few lessons. And one of the things I just love about the way uh, Ian and Adam set up this panel is they asked us two questions. One was, what's the one thing you learned the hard way, which is such a great question. And then the other was, what are three important things to keep in mind? Um, if for me, I was thinking about how to do successful partnerships. So here's what I come up with uh, when I think about those questions. The thing that I learned the hard way is that it doesn't matter how successful and important a program you are bringing to the table of a potential partnership. Your partner's decision making uh, is first, last, and always going to be about their goals and their challenges. And I think it's really easy to forget that the goal of the partnership is not to get somebody to do your thing or to help you do your thing, I think that the, real, the way to really engage a good partnership is for you to be um, really understanding where they're coming from and what you are offering to those primary challenges. Particularly, I think, in our field, where, again, we are not the primary anti-poverty players. We are, I think, a very exciting sort of new secondary hothouse flower-ish um, uh, boutique field. And so I think that the ability to remember um, that you don't want to impress them, you want to offer a solution to something that they care about. Uh, that, that was a hard lesson to learn. Three important things to keep in mind along that way, uh, uh, along that path. Um, first, I think this is really important, although it's, it sounds a little bit trite. Um, I think you have to work backward from uh, demanding, tracking, and achieving high standards. I don't think you work forward from what's easiest, what general expectations are. Uh, and I think that this was particularly true in the financial empowerment field. Um, when our work got started, you know, mostly it was, uh, I think the expression is butts in chairs. Um, you know, how many people sat in the classroom? How many people looked at your website? How many people did you give a brochure to? Um, and uh, I think if you're really trying to achieve something important, um, a partnership should never work backwards from, well, here's, here's what I think we can all agree will be relatively easy to figure out um, to the point that you were making about data. I think you have to work backwards from what do we think we can really accomplish and how is that going to happen and, and, and what does this really need to be in order to be at its best. Uh, the second um, important thing to keep in mind um, is I think you need to focus on scale and sustainability uh, of your program success right from the beginning. I think your long-term strategy should always inform your short-term strategy. Don't put together a program, I mean, particularly for those of you in government or working with government, you don't want to put together a program that can't be replicated. You won't, don't want to put together a program that can't be scaled. All you're doing 
is underscoring um, uh, an interesting point that nobody can do anything with. So I really think you want to think about what's it going to take to scale this up? How do we structure this program so that even our early pilot efforts um, are about scalable models? And the sustainability is really important, too. When we put together um, our financial empowerment center model, for example, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was the ability for us to be able to own enough of the data that we could at any given time be pulling it and reporting on it and having press conferences on it because we knew that there was a political sustainability strategy this work. We needed to be showing partners and showing political stakeholders where those wins were and where the, where the crisis points were. Um, so focusing on that in the way that you design the program in the beginning, I think, is really important. And then the third point sort of plays off the, the, the first observation I made, which is I think you need to solve your, pro your key partner's challenges um, rather than just advancing your own uh, aspirational objectives. I think that um, the real turning point in our work when we stopped banging on doors saying, please, could we figure out how to get a financial counselor into this workforce development program was when partner organizations started to come to us and saying things like, um, in prisoner reentry programs, uh, we can't, they're staying in provisional housing longer than we can sustain. Uh, what, what can we do to, to help move them out? Um, and so the ability to step forward and say, well, let's take a look at what financial counseling could do, not because I can tell you how successful financial counseling is, but more importantly, articulating the super vitamin effect, which is, um, oh, did I miss the stop sign? Oh, good Lord. Okay. Um, you know, which is, how do I solve your pain points? There it is. Um, how, how do I solve your pain points? How do I help you um, really identify? Because you, we all know that the pain points in social services really hinge upon people's underlying financial instability. The number one or the number two reason that domestic violence victims keep going back again and again to abusive relationships is because of their finances. So programs that are focused on the core uh, services that you give to domestic violence victims, of course, all make sense. But when you integrate financial counseling or safe banking into, or savings opportunities into the mix, you don't just say, look, I helped somebody open a bank account you figure out a way to say, look, helping somebody open a b their own bank account um, is starting to move the needle um, on your victims escaping um, from bad situations. So I think uh, those, are, those are my learned observations, and I hope they're helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's not often I get the last word, so I'm really appreciative. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about our Smart Saver program, but since I know you guys have heard so much about that, I won't actually talk about exactly what we do, but more what we've been learning from it. But maybe I could just start by saying that um, Smart Saver itself is the product of a whole lot of hard lessons that I and the volunteers of our organization, our board volunteers, have learned over many, many years, um, having experience in convening different kinds of partnerships uh, to affect transformative change in a lot of different issue areas, everything from affordable housing to environmental issues and even violence prevention. Uh, basically, what we've learned in our experiences of convening is that if you want to affect uh, change, if you want to really have impact on any system, you really have to involve all parts of the system uh, in your discussions and in your thinking. And that means not only you know, taking on an intention of influencing all the different parts of the system, but also being willing to be influenced by different perspectives uh, from the private and public and philanthropic sectors. At SmartSaver, the way that we've embraced this is by working in active partnership with all of the parts of the system that go into the delivery of the Canada Learning Bond, the RESP. So not only do we partner with a lot of uh, great community-based partners across the country who have direct access to the families that we're trying to reach, but we also partner very actively with financial institutions that have the authority and the, the ability to actually set up and, and manage RESP accounts for families. And we, uh, we partner very actively with government, which ultimately provides the money for these kids' accounts. Trying to animate and 
sort of you know work in constant partnership with so many partners may seem like a really challenging way to do our work and and to be sure it it is you just ask any of the smart saver staff who are here and they'll tell you just how challenging it is and it's tempting to think sometimes you know maybe we shouldn't try to take on so much of the system. Maybe we should just stick to our knitting as a community-based organization and say, you know, point to this is government's responsibility to do this part, and this is financial institutions' uh, responsibility to do this other part. But then whenever I think that way, I'm reminded of a cartoon I saw of four guys sitting in a rowboat. There's two guys at the low end of the rowboat, and they're furiously bailing water. And there's two guys sitting up high in the other end of the rowboat saying, we're sure glad the hole's not at our end. <laughs> the point is that the goal that we've taken on is to deliver the Canada Learning Bond to more families. And what our experience is, is that we make better tracks in doing that if we work in partnership to get that done. So, so what have I learned from working this way with such diverse partners? Number one, I've learned the importance of making sure that our we and our partners trust each other. You know, we don't, we don't have anything like the same organizational cultures, and we speak very different languages at times, I find. But we have the same priority on the learning bond and getting that into the hands of families. And as long as we feel a commitment to each other's success and we're, we feel accountable to each other, I know that we're adding value to our partnership. The second thing that I've learned is really, vive la différence. If, if we don't know something, we seek out partners who do know that thing. If there's something we can't do, we seek out partners who can. Um, we did a very extensive evaluation at the end of our three-year Toronto pilot, and you know, people really, for the most part, really liked Smart Saver, but the best feedback that I got personally was that somebody said that I was really good at knowing what I don't know. And I, I, I feel that's important. And whatever I don't know, I want to find a partner who knows that thing to make up for our shortcomings. It's the different capabilities and the different opportunities that our partners have that really create the win-win in SmartSaver. And at the same time, it's really important to understand that all of our different partners also face very different constraints. We need to know what those are and take in those into account as we go along. And finally, the last thing that I've learned that's really important in aligning with our partners is the importance of encouraging shared ownership and shared leadership. We don't try to direct how our partners approach our shared goal, and I think that that's one of the things that we've learned the hard way. That means that things often don't go the way that we would have planned but that's usually a better, for a better result. We follow our partner's lead most of the time, and we only provide help if they ask us for it. For SmartSaver, in the delivery of the Canada Learning Bond from the time an eligible family finds out about it to the time that there is money successfully in the bank, aligning for impact really is like being part of a relay team. We're not running together. We're always ready to pass the baton. But by working together, I think we're all going to reach the finish line. Thanks. OK, gang. So the microphones, right? There's one there. There's one there. And I'm going to flag you down if you make it there. Um, but to the panel, let's start a conversation that um, picks up on, on these three threads. Um, May talked about trust. Graham talked about goodwill. Uh, there was a thematic across everyone of some kind of empathy, either empathy about the other or a sense of meaningful connection with those that are, in which our work is all about. And it strikes me that in the absence of those features, right, those values, you're not going to get as far ahead, whether it's in Peel or New York or in St. John or in the dissemination of the Smart Saver program. And yet, how much time do we spend working on trust, working on empathy, working on a sense of authentic connection? Um, is that a fair read of the work that we're doing to try to align and have a, 
uh, a collective effort, that these are actually core to the work? Or is that uh, nice to have stuff that uh, uh, just shows up when we get, get a chance to speak at the mic at a conference? What do you think? I'll be a New Yorker and jump in. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Um, I think it's lovely to say, but I, I wouldn't be telling the truth I think, if I said it. Um, I, I have found, in particular, I'm thinking about the partnerships that we have with financial institutions. Um, I've really found that it was more productive to be thinking about um, aligning goals and figuring out where you may be coming from a different perspective. Uh, and I think you mentioned the same thing. You're coming from a different perspective. You want to understand what their pain point is. You want to understand what a win for them is. And I think you want to create the Venn diagram um, that is the middle. And so I, I, I don't see it necessarily in, in human relational terms. I really think about it in terms of how do I create a win for a partner that I need um, that similarly gets me the win that I'm looking for. Great. May, do you want to jump in on that? We actually, um, at SmartSaver, we put a lot of uh, effort into making that personal connection and making sure that we're on the same wavelength with our partners uh, when it comes to the way that we uh, believe that RESP education needs to be done, the way that the opportunity should be presented to families, the way that choice around providers and you know what it means to start this account, uh, the way that that goes on. And that's because if we put in the investment up front so that everybody sort of you know, has a, a similar understanding and we trust what we can rely on for, to, for each other to do as part of that system, then we're able to move on, we're able to foster partnerships with others, knowing that in, some, in that community, they're in good hands. They're, things are going on, um, you know, they're gonna reach out if they need something and, and they're not if they don't need something. Um, but that allows us to really scale. Great, Althea? I think from our point of view, um, one of the things we really look at that I'd said before that I really stressed is about the people who are actually going to be using the programs that we developed and that for us and the people who we work with and the people who are employed by our corporation or our SINs, these are people who are really in it for the heart. They want something better for their fellow New Brunswickers, for the children for the future, for the moms and for the dads. So for at the start for us, it is really about empathy. It is about being concerned about the, those people. And being able to share that empathy and that warmth, and okay, the warm and the fuzzies. Being able to share that with the people that you're talking to, the partners that you want to develop with and connect with, being, being able to share that, that idea that the program that you are going to develop is going to have an impact on Sally's life. And that's really what it's all about. We do these partnerships, we do these business, we do these programs, we do these promotions and these communications and everything else like that. Yes, that's hard business, but we're really doing it so that person has a better life and that they can um, participate more fully in our culture, in our lives, be a contributing member to society, being able to be stand up and be accounted, and that's what it's all about for us. Right. Graham? Uh, just uh, in, in terms of working collaboratively and engaging partners, I, I have a little quiz that I do with all of my staff. It's called the 10 Skills of a Great Collaborator. I've made them all up and I expect them to order these in preference. But what I'm looking for is if you don't have great listener as one of the top one or two, if it makes three, I'm worried then you're not going to be a great collaborator. You can't sell something to somebody, an idea, a concept, a partnership, until you've listened to them and heard what's of strategic importance to them as a person within their organization, their organization's role in the community. It's, 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 it's concentric circles going out. But you listen before you seek to sell, and they'll tell you what their strategic interests are. That's how you bring an idea forward, listening first, talking later. You know, I, my work uh, before the work with community foundations was with the sport community. So a collective was just a great opportunity to compete with each other, okay? It was, it was let's put people in the room so we can define our differences, you know? And, and 
And uh, the, the best part was the rowers and the canoers, you know? The rowers go backwards and the canoers go forwards, right? And, and, and so, so there was this culture that was dominant about not working well around a, uh, um, uh, not working well together. And we figured out something that's reflected in the panel. Sometimes we needed common goal, which is where Jonathan is. It's like, how do we solve each other's challenges and pursuit in the pursuit of the goal? Other times the goal got in the way, like Olympic medals, that doesn't help actually. There's a whole lot of people that want sport participation. The common goal didn't work, right? But, but with that group, you could actually do it on common values. But then you had to really listen to each other. You had to understand each other. You needed the trust factor. And then you could do a lot, even though the goals were different. So I think there's a feature to that that uh, um, comes out. I, I want to turn now to, to language. Like everyone had this thing about language, you know? And um, I love that. What was the name of the program again, Althea? The way that it was described? Just grab the mic. Yeah. Get your piece of the money pie. Get your piece of the money pie on the one hand. Yeah. Financial literacy on the other, you know? What, what does language uh, help or hinder? Does language give us what we need to do collective work? Does it get in the way? Uh, where's the role of framing and language, you know? Smart saver is a bit of framing. What, where, where does language fit in the work that we're trying to do? Anyone want to jump in first? The, uh, the name of Smart Saver is actually was an interesting exercise. Coming up with the name Smart Saver was uh, a bit of a you know a, a, a process in itself of trying to capture the combined ideas of education and saving, and also combining words that were going to be pretty easy to pronounce across a lot of different languages. So it was that in itself was a, one of the language considerations for us. But when I was talking about language earlier, I was talking about the fact that uh, as partnering as we do, not only with a lot of different community-based organizations, but also working in a multilingual environment, and also working with a lot of financial institutions, everybody's language is different. So when we're talking to a settlement organization, the jargon that they use might be quite different than a childcare center or a school. And when we talk to TD, they speak a different language than RBC or Meridian. So um, we operate in a very multilingual environment and it's all in English. I would agree. I, th I think language really matters. I think that, um, you know, when you're trying to communicate or advertise what you're offering or what you're presenting to people, um, for us, the big light bulb uh, that really is um, illuminated, thank you, um, our, our thinking about language was this notion of respect. Um, I think one of the great myths of the financial literacy field was that people just needed more information. Um, they just needed to be educated. And I think that the real light bulb for us was that these people were paying a whole lot more attention to their finances than the rest of us were because we could afford to not always be right. Um, and so talking about people with low incomes rather than low income people, talking about financial empowerment rather than financial literacy, you know, having language reflect respect um, as a way, in the way that you were suggesting, as a way of really um, communicating to people that um, we were trying to meet their needs rather than trying to dictate from them to them from our position of superiority. Great. Do you want in or do we, should we go to the question? Yeah, let's go, let's go to the question. Hi, um, I've already introduced myself, but I'll just say my name. My name's Amal. Um, I want to thank you all for all, all the work that you do first and foremost. However, I do have a slight difference of opinion. Um, so when a family or a mom, let's say for example, and her six children are refugees in Turkey and they come to Canada to come to Canada for a better life, they are hit with a $10,000 transportation loan. And when that happens, the first thing that's on their mind is not the Canada Learning Bond. It's using the child tax money that they get from the government to pay back the government. So that's just my opinion. And I don't think it's fair. Thank you for that. Let's, uh, let's, let's weave in any re reflections to that, to the questions that, that as we think about our collective work, what's it like when someone's coming looking for something and our collective capability doesn't align with what they're looking for? Um, how do we, uh, and, and it, I want to tie this in, Jonathan, to your super vitamin. 
uh, idea. So here, here, I think there's something very interesting about you finding a way to take what you do so well and your organization does so well and connect it to other agendas. It could be connecting it to the, the welcoming of newcomers agenda. Um, when you do that, how do you make it work? Like, how, not, not the why to do it, I think it's evident why to do it, but how do you actually make that work? So you're relevant in housing or you're relevant in the settlement community. Uh, what are some of, what's a little bit of what you've learned? Um, it's a great question. Um, I think that, uh, I think you have to, in assessing who a good, you have to find a good partner. I mean, I think that's where, part of where you start. And I think a good partner is a combination um, of some of the soft stuff and the hard stuff. The soft stuff is you find a partner that um, either shares your values or has a common goal or has seen uh, the light somehow, or, you know, is interested in and will help drive, push the work. Um, the harder part of those uh, experiments uh, is marrying data. Um, these are different systems trying to talk to each other. So um, in some cases, that's easier than others. So for example, it's one thing for me to say to a housing authority, um, let's code the housing residents that have had financial counseling through our centers and those that haven't, and let's run data on arrears. That's pretty easy to do, and you could start to show the effect. Well, look what the impact of financial counseling might have had. And for the researchers in the room, I know that's not a perfect RCT. Um, <laughs> but, um, but in other cases, finding partners that have the kind of underlying control data can be very difficult. Domestic violence is a perfect example. Um, there's no central data about um, people who, who, who get those services for really you know, important reasons. And so trying to prove prove the super vitamin effect, uh, the role that financial counseling or banking or savings plays in domestic violence is much, much harder to do. It doesn't make it any less important, um, but it's a lot harder. Uh, so I, I think, uh, two thoughts. Uh, I think we should just take at face value the very valid point that this young woman has just made. For a lot of people, there are much more important things that are much more present and right there in front of their face than getting around to thinking about the Canada Learning Bond or any other piece of longer term thinking. And getting people to a position where they can begin to think about those things means that we need to use some of our collective energy to work against those policies that were just mentioned that counter the ability of people to become empowered and to look after themselves and their families. And so I liked, you pointed out that in your province, one of the key things is when we find things that work at cross purposes to what we're trying to achieve, we do something about it. And I think if you begin to look at the power that's been assembled around financial literacy and empowerment, the voice of the big banks and many of our other business sector partners on issues related to refugee settlement and basic subsistence uh, income could be very powerful and as yet unharnessed ally in some of the things that make financial planning, literacy, or empowerment a frill for a lot of families in this country. So, yeah. So we've got five minutes left. I just want everyone to have a chance for one kind of final reflection. And um, it could be what you want, but maybe a bit of encouragement. We have one collective here. Right, the, there's the collective that is that that extends beyond the work in Peel or the work uh, around it, uh, one particular program or what's up in New Brunswick. So um, take a moment. Maybe we'll work from May back to to Graham, uh, just to ref reflect on uh, uh, what is it collectively that we have as our our big opportunity here. Well, I was asked the question earlier about <coughs> how do we align. Um, to increase our collective impact on reducing poverty. And when I think about the work that we do at Omega, I think about the fact that we make a point of aligning ourselves with organizations that you know, sort of feel the same way that we do, that um, for the families that we're trying to serve, and we're, we are serving families with, with children, the, the poverty that they're experiencing is what they very much want to be a temporary state, that they can't wait to escape. And, and we see our responsibility as helping them
to escape poverty as soon as it is uh, at all humanly possible. So I think of, I think of um, in, in our case, in the establishment of education savings and the establishment of savings for their children, as being one of those steps that's a transit, it's a transition thing. It makes families often feel like they're gaining some control over their financial state, they're uh, gaining an ability to plan for the future of their family and, and work towards an aspiration for their children. And uh, not to say that it is uh, necessarily the most important priority for every family, but for many families, this is a very high one. Um, and so when I think about aligning for impact, we always want to work with organizations, and we'll work with any organizations that really share that, that wish, that if we can start to assemble these building blocks for families, where with each little success, they start to gain that confidence and that sense of future possibility and, and greater real financial empowerment for themselves, then I think that one after another, we're just gonna pick off these programs until they are truly accessing the benefits that are, they're entitled to and they are truly participating uh, in financial services the way that they should be. Um, I would, uh, I think of this uh, answer and, and what you all might, might be able to do as a collective uh, a little bit as a yin and the yang. I believe strongly that this work is so important that it needs to be included in the tool belt of public services. Um, and I think that the only way to make that case to attract and sustain public money for this, for this field um, is through the yang, which is the professionalizing of this field. I think this field is rapidly evolving in more professional ways, in talking about data, in ways that we've never talked about data before, in talking about accountability, consistency, training. I think that the more professional this field and you all hold yourselves and help each other to, to achieve, um, the more likely you are to achieve what I think is the, is the real goal, which is to make this work um, part of the way government um, thinks about its, its responsibility to people. When I think of the power of this collective, there's two words to me that comes to mind. Um, one is positive. Everyone in here is positive that the work that you do is going to make a change in someone's life or a group of people's lives or your community or your province or your country. Without that positive feeling in your heart and your soul, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be doing this work. You are positive that you are going to make a change. And the other word that comes to mind is communication. We've, we learned this at this conference over these two days. We've learned this at every conference that we've gone to, is that the power that we have is communicating with each other, setting up networks, setting up networks in your community, in your province. We talked about even, could we set up a network in the, in the country where the provinces and everyone else could connect? Because that is where your power is. That's where your impact is going to be. Yes, everyone does it on their own, but are we, are we uh, repeating ourselves? Are we recreating the wheel when we really don't have to? So be positive and keep your communication up. And that's the best things for me that I could think of. Well, I, I would only add one last thought. And, and that is, when we talk about the collective strength of the people in this room and the people that are working in this sector, I think we somehow often envision that there'll be some sort of a magic bullet, a single strategy that will enable us to unite. And I don't know if you've ever played with guns, but rifles are pretty effective, but shotguns are way better. <laughs> and if we're gonna blow a hole in this problem, I think everybody should just blow off their shotgun in a thousand different directions and let's see what that accumulates in terms of the damage we can create. <laughs> so I'm not, you know, pick, pick your analogy, right? You can, you, can go, you can go shotgun or, you know, thousand flowers blooming, you know, but, but I, you know, so be careful on the streets appeal. You know, the, the, so that, that, was, that was great. Great to finish with, with, with laughter and that positive New Brunswick spirit and a, a whole lot of wisdom from the panel. So join me in thanking all of them.
What an amazing...